Hi everybody, I'm Rick Beato. Today's Everything Music, we're going to talk about how to use EQ. This is for any type of recording, whether we're doing a rock band, whether we're making, mixing orchestral music, anything. I'm going to talk about what types of EQs that we have to work with in the analog and digital realm. Also, what are the frequencies that you're going to want to work with with each particular instrument. So let's just talk about two different types of EQ that uh, people that are generally uh, considered, which is additive and subtractive. Now that's pretty self-explanatory. Additive EQ is boosting frequencies. Subtractive EQ is attenuating, which means reducing frequencies, okay? Now you'll hear people say that wider cues are better for, um, for boosting and narrow cues are better for subtractive. That's, that's a general rule of thumb, but I wouldn't necessarily stick with that completely. Um, but I do use subtractive EQ quite a lot to get rid of anomalies like I was talking about in my video of frequencies of music. I got into it a little bit. Now, there's some terms that we need to discuss. Like, what is Q? Well, Q means the bandwidth. There's a bell curve that you... Uh, this diagram shows you the difference between a wide bandwidth Q and a narrow bandwidth Q. The wide bandwidth Q has a center point of 3K or 3000 Hertz, and the narrow bandwidth has a center point of about 400 Hertz. As the arrow goes up, the gain increases. The arrow that goes downward, the gain decreases. So the narrow bandwidth EQ is a cut, and the wide bandwidth Q is a boost. So the narrower the Q, the less frequencies that are affected, and the wider the Q, the more frequencies that are affected. Okay, there's two different types of equalizers typically. We have parametric equalizer and a graphic equalizer. Many of you know the difference between these. Parametric EQ is a little bit more versatile because you can vary the frequency. You have gain and you have Q, okay? Uh, and you can have multiple bands. In the digital realm, you have many, many different possibilities of EQs. Uh, if you use a Waves Q10, for example, you've got 10 frequencies. You have a 10-band parametric. Most of the parametric EQs that are in the digital realm will have a high and low pass filter, which we'll get to in a minute. I talked about it a little bit in the video the other day. Then we have a graphic EQ. Typically, uh, they are multiple bands. Usually a 31 band is the most common, and they have sliders on them that will go up. It depends. They might go up plus 6 dB up or plus 12 or minus 6 or minus 12 on the way down. Some will go, it really depends. Digital ones can go bigger than that. Um, the, the parametric EQ, the range can be really great. Certain plugins will have really great ranges like the Waves Q, um, uh, the Waves EQ that I was talking about, like the Q10, I want to say goes six, uh, 18 dB, plus or minus 18 dB. The metric halo channel strip EQ will go plus and minus 24 dB. That's one of the uh, that's probably the biggest cut and boost of any digital EQ I can think of. Um, okay, so these are your types of EQs. Let's talk about how we use these now. Okay, the next thing to know about are filters. Okay, there are four types of filters that we use for EQing. The first one is the high pass filter, HPF. High pass filter looks like this. That's kind of diagram. It's basically, it lets high frequencies pass through. We call it a low cut, okay? That's the other name for it, low cut. Okay, this is the cutoff frequency here. Let's say that could be 80 hertz. And this slope can be down, go down minus 12 dB or minus 24 dB typically. But the cutoff frequency, you can move it back and forth. It might be at 40, it might be at 20, it could be up at 500 hertz or whatever. Everything else will be attenuated, whatever you have it set to, the slope. The low pass filter, LPF, is really a high cut, and it looks like this. That's why the slope goes down, it's cutting off high frequencies. Cutoff frequency, let's say the cutoff fre frequency here is 6K. That means anything above 6K will go down either if it's set at tw minus 12 dB slope or minus 24 dB slope. Uh, it's to your choosing, but that's typically how those are. Bandpass filter. Basically, a bandpass filter is a combination of a low and high pass filter. You got two cutoff frequencies, two different slopes, self explanatory. And then there's a notch filter or band rejection filter. 
Notch filter looks like this. I was talking about one of my videos, the 4K notch, that people that have hearing damage that are musicians, they have the 4K notch. That means that frequency there would be 4K, 4 kilohertz. Uh, that's the, that would be the center point. So this is the stop frequency here. This is the band pass. So everything here gets through, everything here gets through. But at 4K, if that's our center point, it could be anywhere. Uh, everything at 4K will be attenuated, whatever that dB is. Let's say that's minus 18 dB, then everything will get attenuated down to minus 18 dB. And the Q, okay, how narrow or, or uh, that, can, that can be set. You typically with notch filters are there to notch out really, really specific frequencies. That's why you use them. That's why they're called notch filters. They're typically very tight Qs. Those are filters. Okay, I want to talk about some of the most famous type of analog EQs, and this is just for your information here. Many of you won't even have a chance to work on these. A lot of these are expensive and are not even at studios anywhere near you. But if you're lucky enough to work on them, here are some of the best sounding ones. You have the Neve 1073. This is a Class A mic pre. It's got a phenomenal sounding EQ. It's got a high pass filter on it, and then it has a low and mid frequency EQ. The low uh, frequencies on it are uh, 35 hertz, 60 hertz, 110 hertz, and 220 hertz. And the mids are 360 hertz, 700 hertz, 1.6k, 3.2k, 4.8k, and 7.2k. So it has six points in the mid range. The 1066 EQ is the same mic pre, has the same mic pre as the 1073, but has a little difference. It's only got a five points of uh, mid range. The low the low frequencies are the same. It's still 35, 60, 110, and 220, but the mid-range is at 700, which is the same, but then 1.2K versus 1.6, 2.4 versus 3.2, which is actually very cool, 3.6, which is very different, and then 7K versus 7.2K. Those are a little bit different. It's actually great if you're able to have those for tracking. Uh, really cool uh, for EQ on uh, instruments where you're, you can actually use different points of EQ. The 1084 is the same EQ as the 1073. This has a, um, ex let me talk about the top end. This has a 12K shelf. The 1066 has a 10K shelf. The 1084 has a switchable shelf. It's, uh, I believe, 10, 12, and 16 uh, uh, switchable shelf. The 1081 Neve Mic Pre EQ is much more versatile than the other ones because it has 10 bands of EQ. It's got four separate EQs on it, two in the low, uh, you have low end, low mid, then you have upper mids and, and top end uh, that, are, that have 10 uh, EQ points each. Really versatile and it's got a five uh, way um, high and low pass filter on it, five positions each way. So it's really versatile, great, great sounding EQ. The API EQs, uh, you've got the 550A, which is a three band EQ, which has uh, high and low shelves on it. I love this EQ, it's really, really great sounding. 550B is a four band EQ. I don't like it as much as the 550A, but it's really useful for certain things. And then you have the 560 graphic EQ, which is a 10 band EQ. This is a great EQ. I use that a lot on things like kick drum or bass guitar, but it's a graphic EQ, very easy to use, really cool. The uh, Poltec EQ, there's basically two different types. They're super expensive. They come in tube or solid state. Then you have the Poltec EQ. These are great EQs for tracking and for mixing. You got the EQP1 program EQ. You've seen it with the big knobs on it, big boost and attenuation knobs. They're phenomenally good sounding. You can buy them in solid state, they're, they're actually remaking them now, uh, solid state or the tube EQ. And then you have their mid-range version, which which is called the uh, EQM. M is for mid-range 13A, or I'm sorry, 1A3. GML, uh, George Massenberg, 8200, five-band fully parametric EQ. You'll see in studios all the time. In mastering rooms, they're really, really surgical. Analog EQs are great sounding. Uh, Electrodyne makes the 511 EQ, which is similar to the Quad 8, which are uh, our older EQs, but they're really great sounding EQs. I use them all the time. Trident A-Range 4-band EQ is, a, is one of my favorite sounding EQs. It's got a lot of different frequencies. I believe each of the four bands has four switchable uh, EQ points on them. 
Uh, then you have the Helios Type 69 EQ that's got a um, it's got a top end. It's got a mid range that goes between 700 and 16k. I think the old ones only went to 6k. The newer ones at the reissues uh, go to 16k, and it's got a low end. Um, it's got a low end boost and attenuation on it too. And then you have the SSL EQ, which is actually probably the most used because people use it in mixing. Uh, you have the E series and G series are the most common. They have a little bit different uh, sound to them, different EQ points. They're used on mixes all the time. I've used them a million times. I use plug-in versions of them. I use analog versions of them on, on SSL consoles. These are your main analog EQs. Now let's talk about digital EQs. Let's talk about some of the common digital EQs that I use uh, when I'm tracking and mixing, really when I'm mixing. Uh, the McDSP filter bank EQs, the E606, the F202, and the P606. They used to come in E2, e, E4, and E6. They have a high and low shelf. They're great for doing effects like uh, um, like telephone filtering effects and just general. These are all these are great EQs. All three of these are. Um, the Metric Halo Channel Strip EQ has a six-band parametric EQ. It's got compression on it. It's got a gate on it. It's actually got a really good gate on it. It's got um, a, um, a de-esser on it, and it has one of the tightest cues you can get. Any strange frequency that you want to get out, it's plus and minus 24 dB. That's a great, great EQ on that. I've been using that for years. That's, that's the first channel strip really ever made. Waves has many different EQs that, and many very good EQs. The Q10, it's Q2, it's Q3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, but 10 band EQ that it can also do a very tight Q on it. So that's really useful. The uh, V4, the VEQ4 is kind of a Neve type uh, uh, EQ. Um, the Sheps 1073 or Sheps 73, Andrew Sheps, that's his plug in. It's a very good sounding one. There's a Renaissance EQ that, that been around forever. I've used it a million times. They make an API 550 EQ. They have the HEQ Hybrid, which is a cool plug-in. And then, of course, the SSL E and G series that, uh, that are part of the uh, channel strip. They also make a G series that's just a standalone EQ, which I've used a million times, all, all of those. Universal Audio makes many great EQs. The Cambridge EQ is one of my favorites. It's a parametric EQ. It's got high, high and low shelf on it. They make a Pultec EQ. They make Neve 1073 and 1081 EQs. They make API EQs. They make Arison uh, EQ, Neve 31102 EQ. They make a Trident A range uh, EQ, and they have a Helios Type 69 EQ. I think I own all those. Um, Fab Filter makes the Pro Q2. Fab Filter is a great company. They make a very, very good gate and compressor also. I love their gate especially uh, because it has ducking on it. Anyways, the Pro Q2 is a fantastic EQ. And then, of course, Sound Toys Filter Freak. It's been around forever. It's a classic. It's got many different things that you can do with it, many type of filtering effects. Uh, that's a really, really must-have for a digital EQ. Okay, I'm gonna talk about some important drum frequencies. Now, this is gonna really vary depending on the genre of music that you're doing. Um, this can be for tracking or mixing, but these are areas to, uh, depending on the style that you're gonna to wanna to pay attention to, okay? With the kick drum, the low end of the kick drum can be anywhere between 50 hertz and 100 hertz, depending on where you decide where you want it. You might be boosting 50 hertz a lot because you want that big, big low end. If that's the case, those are the areas that I'm going to notch out on the on the bass guitar because I'm going to want to have that kick drum be kind of the low element in the mix. Or you can boost higher and keep the bass down in those low frequencies. If I'm going with a 50 hertz kick, I might go with like with an 80 hertz uh, uh, boost on the bass guitar to bring that out because you don't want them fighting in that frequency range. It takes energy away from your mix. Um, now, cutting between 360 and 800 hertz for rock music. That's typical uh, of uh, in for rock or country, any type of commercial music, you're typically cutting out those that mid-range frequencies. One of the reasons that I say 360 is because that is the, on a Neve 1073, that's the frequency where I cut. Because um, that's, the, that's the low mid I want to cut out. If I'm on an SSL EQ or something, 
I'll probably cut out between 500 and 800 hertz in that area of mid-range. It really depends on the sound of the kick, but you want to dump that mid-range up because it, it clouds up your mix. That is, unless you're going for a Led Zeppelin kick drum sound, which has a lot of mid-range and it'll have a lot of 1K in it. So that double-headed kick drum sound, if I'm going to record a double-headed kick drum, I want it to sound like John Bonham, I'm not going to EQ any of that stuff out. I probably won't even EQ it at all while I'm cutting it. I might, uh, I might boost a little bit of top end on it, depending on how much cymbal wash I have. The attack of the kick, once again, this is going to depend on style. It could be anywhere between 2 and 4K, or even a little higher. If it's Metallica, it's going to be 5K, 6K, really boosted high. If it's something, something like Andy Wallace and he's EQing a kick drum, he's, he's going to go for the lower end of the spectrum so that you don't have a ticky sounding attack on your kick drum. He wants to have it where it's where it's where um, has more chunk to it and more tone. So I would go with the lower EQs. But between 2 and 4K is that, that where that attack is going to lie on the kick drum. The snare drum, the important frequencies. The low end of the snare drum is going to be between 100 and 220 or so to 250 um, hertz and it really depends on the tuning of the snare the lower the tuning the lower the 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 boost these are I'm talking about boosting these areas okay um, this is where your smack is going to be around 1k to 1.4 maybe even down 9 900 and 930 or so but that's where your uh, where your tone of your snare is right there and then 7K is up where the snare wires are. That's going to be the top end of the snare. If you want that snare to kind of break out of the mix, uh, you're going to want to boost up in that area. That's going to really make the, the, the snare jump out of the track. That's where the snare wires are. The toms. Um, depending on how you mic the toms, I mic the toms typically with two microphones on the top and the bottom. because the, And I use a Y cable with the bottom mic out of phase. I do that because it self EQs the drum. On the snare, we we I always record with a top and bottom mic as well. But the bottom mic I blend in, which is out of phase with the top mic. Uh, the bottom mic I blend in for taste. A lot of times um, in tracks, you'll have a lot of um, uh, you might have snare wires that are rattling too much, and you might want to gate it. So I'll record those on separate t tracks typically. Uh, but with the toms. If you just have one microphone on the top, a typical microphone for Tom that always sounds great is a Sennheiser 421. I will usually cut the mid-range if I'm recording just with a top mic around 500 hertz or so. It might be a little bit above, might be a little bit below, depending on if it's a what size Tom it is. And typically, I'll record with a rock band of 13 and a 16 or 13, 16, 18. And I will be cutting out in slightly different areas depending on the size of the drum and uh, and how they sound. It's really hard to give hard and fast rules about it, but this mid-range cut for clarity is going to be uh, pretty typical. Hat and ride, I filter anything from 200 hertz and below out, period. You end up getting a lot of the... Uh, sound of the on the hi-hat of the pedal noise you get the you get the stair the stand rattling on the ride cymbal same kind of thing a lot of it is just noise that you get below there there's no important information that you need below 200 hertz on either of those i just filter right out when i'm tracking it and i might filter it out again when i'm mixing overheads i usually filter out 40 hertz you're always safe with that that, this depends, too, on style. If you're going for overheads as cymbal mics, a lot of times I'll EQ, I'll high-pass filter all the way up until four or 500 hertz. I'll just dump all of it out. Then it takes all the, the um, need for uh, your, your, your phase. It takes the, that out of equation with the, uh, with the snare drum because the snare bottom end, having a lot of uh, fat bottom end in the snare, a lot of it depends on your overheads being in phase with the snare uh, but there's a lot of great information around 100 hertz on the uh, on the overheads too. So it really once again depends on the style. I say cut the mids. A lot of times I'll cut the mids depending on how they sound. If I'm getting uh, a lot of the drum set in there and I want more clarity of the drums, more clarity of the toms, I'll sometimes will scoop out some of the mud in the mid range on the overheads. But once again, this really depends on the style. There's not a lot of hard and fast rules on these things, except for the things that I wrote down. Those are kind of the, uh, the, the key areas to look for in the drum set for rock music and country music.
Next, I want to talk about the bass. Now, there's two different bass signals that I typically record. One will be the bass DI, which is the direct signal, and then the bass amp. Now, the bass DI and bass amp are going to take have two different sounds to them. The amp, I'm typically going to go for my, uh, my tone. I'm going to have distortion on it, grit, things to make it cut through the mix. The DI is the sound that I've got the most very uh, ability to vary. I can put a uh, a distortion plug in on it. I can do. I can run it flat. I can do so many different things. That sound you can change. You can reamp through your bass amp uh, after the track is done. So the DI is really important to have. The important areas of the bass: the low end of the bass, 60 hertz to 110. This can actually be down even uh, even down to 40 hertz. I'm going to even put that here. I'll change it to 40. But typically. The bass, the good bass stuff on really fat recordings lies somewhere in between there. I'm not going to be boosting 40 hertz usually. A lot of times, uh, it's it's uh, people don't realize that many times you have to high pass the bass even. There's a lot of rumble that you do not want to have in your mix that will take energy away from your mix if you have too much bottom end in it. You have to have the right bottom end so that it doesn't fight with the kick drum. But a lot of times, uh, uh, you know, this is where the Neve, the Neve EQ that I typically will use on bass is at 60 and 110 or the two points. So if I'm going to boost the low, low end, I'm going to boost at 60 hertz. But um, a lot of times I'm going to boost between 80 and, uh, 80 and 100, 80 and 110 hertz. 300 hertz, why do I have that on there? Because typically if you EQ a bass on uh, small speakers like on a laptop, if you plug into to Pro Tools on your Mac laptop or your PC laptop, or plug into GarageBand and monitor through that or monitor through little little speakers, that's about the first frequency you're going to actually hear. You're going to boost in that area or add some type of distortion that will bring it out there because that's that's where you're going to actually hear the bass on small speakers, that low, because they're not even going to pick up these things. You're not even going to hear that. 800 hertz is kind of the upper mids. That's where the sweet spot of the bass is, uh, where the tone, where it's really easily heard in a mix. Um, so that's going to be in that area is going to be really important to pay attention to. And then 1.6 K to 2 K is where the, the top end of the base is. I'll put 2 K here, 2 K. That's where the top, top end, the brightness comes in. You're going to want to brighten it in a mix, especially if you're mixing with rock, with heavy rock, with heavy guitars, you're going to want to add some top end there for that to cut through the mix. Um, and then a lot of times I will filter out the top, top end on it because there's just noise up there that you do not need. But the, uh, the bass DI and the bass amp are going to have very different sounds to them. And it really depends how you EQ them is it depends on the bass. If you have active pickups versus passive pickups, if you're recording a Fender jazz bass, a Fender, uh, precision bass, an Ernie Ball uh, bass with active electronics or a Warwick or a, uh, uh, you know, any type of bass. They all, all basses sound different. All of them need different attentions, but uh, all of them need different attention in different areas. But your fatness on your bottom end is going to be, you know, really, I'm going to go back and put the 60, 60 to 110 hertz. Somewhere in there is your big, going to be where, be, be where your big bottom end is. 300 hertz is where you're going to hear it on small speakers. 800 hertz is kind of the sweet spot, the upper mids. Right here is your top end of your bass. Anything after that uh, is pretty useless. So um, that's your bass sound. Next, distorted electric guitars. I'm talking about distorted electric guitars because clean electric guitars, it really depends on the sound. If you're going through a Fender Deluxe or Fender Twin or through a Vox AC30 and there's just a little bit of grit on it or they're perfectly pristine clean, it all depends on the on the song that you're playing to, so you can't give any hard and fast rules. With distorted electric guitars, even if you're using them in a film scoring uh, uh, instance, I usually going to high pass filter the guitars around 50 hertz or so. There's there's a, not a lot of information except for mud down below there, and it's going to uh, going to make your mix much clearer by doing that. Uh, woofy buildup. If people are palm muting and do, doing something like that for, for heavy rock, typically that's going to be between 140 and 150 hertz. You're going to have a big, 
you'll see a big spike. And if you EQ that out, I'll spot EQ those spots and you'll reduce them down and you'll have a lot more control of your sound. I never compress distorted electric guitars because they're already compressed. Your mid-range in your guitar, it really depends on the guitar sound that you get and what kind of amp you're doing. Uh, sometimes people want to cut their mids. Sometimes they want to boost their mids. You know, if you're using Marshalls and you want a big fat mid-range sound that kind of grabs you, uh, you know, you might be boosting in one of these areas. But like I said, it depends, really depends on the sound. But your top end of your guitar is going to be around 3 or 4K. That's going to make your guitars jump out of the mix uh, and be really aggressive sounding for the heavier rock and for metal. That top end is 3 and 4K. A lot of times there's a high-end fizz that you're going to want to filter out. Uh, sometimes I'll filter out up above 8K. Really, once again, depends on the sound. Sometimes I'm boosting at 10K you know, just to get some more uh, brilliance out of it. But so it's, once again, I can't make any hard and fast rules, but these are generally areas that I am going to be looking at on distorted electric guitars. Acoustic guitar, once again, you can't really generalize. All acoustic guitars are different. You might have drop tunings that, that uh, so, so your low end is going to be in different spots than it normally would be, or some open tunings. You may be playing with a capo. Typically, most of the stuff under 50 hertz or so is I filter out. 40 hertz to be safe, but at least usually, usually around 50 hertz. Your presence of your acoustic guitar is usually going to be around 2 to 2 to 2.5k two or so, is going to be where you're going to make it jump out of the mix. You're gonna, you have to be careful with things because that's kind of where the EQ points of the piano to get the piano to, to jump out of the mix as well. But um, uh, with acoustic guitar, that's gonna be a really good area. And then I will typically, to make it sparkle, you know, hit that 10K. Uh, a lot of times when I'm tracking, I wanna boost that to, to give it a little bit of sparkle and, and extension on the top end. Okay, the piano. Typical EQ points for that, it really depends. If it's a solo piano feature, I may not filter anything on the bottom end. Um, and I might add some attack, I might darken it. A lot of that's gonna happen in the mic placement, so I might not do anything. I'm gonna try and get my sound as close to it as I can. If you're using a digital piano, um, it depends on the mix. Usually uh, for rock, to get it to sound, uh, break through the mix, 2.2 to 2.7K is usually a, a boost point. A lot of times I'm cutting the low mids and dense mixes, unless I've got octaves uh, to reinforce a bass, uh, a bass part. But uh, a lot of times there's a lot of low mids that there's mud in that you can cut out. But then again, a lot of times, you know, sometimes I'll add fifths in the bass to reinforce the low end. And I won't do that because I don't have any other information. So once again, this is all dependent on what your material that you're working on is. It's hard to, it's, it's, it's difficult to make hard and fast rules on EQ. You actually have to listen to a song and evaluate what it needs to happen based on what's, what's happening around it. But piano can really fill up a mix really fast. So you'll have to make your decisions during the mix depending on what else is happening at the same time. Okay, organs. Now you have many types of organs. You can have a, a pump organ, which is gonna be one kind of thing. I have a pump organ here in my studio, uh, which is gonna need, a re once again, that depends. It's got bellows on it. It's more like, like uh, recording a huge harmonica. Uh, so that's gonna uh, depend on where it is in the mix and the placement. Uh, with a B3, once again, it depends on what you're doing with it in the song. If it's a pad, you know, I'm gonna typically have it in mono, more in the middle of the mix, or I might even have it hard panned. If I'm gonna have a hard pan, I'm gonna take out a lot, a lot of the low end information from it. Because you don't wanna have things with a lot of low end filling up one side of the mix. It'll make your mix unbalanced. You'll actually see it on the meters. So things that have a lot of low end, that's why you place your bass in the center of the mix. Because it, it takes up, it'll make your mix unbalanced if, it's, if it has too much bottom end. Same thing with this, is that I will put it in my, if I'm gonna pan the, the organ over, because sometimes I'll pan it over and I'll put the reverb in the opposite speaker, which is very old school, and I'll have it in mono. Even if I mic it with three mics, I'll still sum them to mono after. But sometimes if I'm gonna do that, I might just mic it with one mic, a distant mic it from five feet back or so. So to, to give any hard or fast EQ rules is difficult because the, the organ you essentially record it, it has the EQ on it. That's what the slider, that's what the uh, 
uh, the the um, drawbars are for is that they're actually EQs. So you really should be doing that as you're recording it, getting the exact sounds that you want. So you don't really need to put much EQ on it. Now, I will say this. When I want an organ to jump out of mix, I will typically add some extra distortion on it. Sometimes I'll do it with a send. I'll send some sans amp to it or something, or I'll put a, a decapitator plug in uh, on a send and send it to the organ track. And that will bring it out of the mix without having to add any EQ. It just makes it have a little extra harmonic information. That's what adding distortion does to things. I'll do it to the snare. I'll do it to the kick drum. Adding that harmonic information will make it uh, have more apparent level. This is a question. This is a question I get asked a lot. What about strings and orchestral instruments? What do you do with those? Well, one of the things I do is generally I'll use effects on them. Uh, even if it's recorded in a hall and it has its own effects, many times I'll feed it into a, a separate reverb so that I'll have more control and I can blend all the libraries and all the sounds together and, and give it a, more of a cohesive sound. I might use more of the close mics and not use as much, you know, if I'm using a Spitfire audio library versus an East-West library versus a Vienna library, uh, I'm trying to, to combine these things and make them all sound like they're happening in the same space, then I'm gonna use an, uh, a separate reverb. And um, I will, a lot of times, EQ the reverb sense for those too. But um, many times to get it to cut through, if you have it in a, in a rock mix, you're gonna have to add some upper mids here, three to four K. You'll notice that, that, that it, just doesn't, it just doesn't cut through. Also, uh, like I was saying on um, the Albion One library, Spitfire Audio, there's a lot of low end rumble that uh, happens after the strings. That's part of the, um, the room ambience that you, you kind of need to filter out depending on, on what you're doing with it. Um, uh, and, and sometimes I cut the low mids if they're, um, usually if it's in a rock track, uh, you're gonna make the arrangement so that it's not competing with the guitars. You're not gonna have that information there. But even in orchestral music, sometimes the low mids can get a bit much. And, um, and you might need to cut those, or you might leave, leave them flat. Once again, it's hard to say because all the libraries sound different. And if you play with different sounds, if you, which I usually, w uh, you know, would suggest not using the same sound uh, in all your different sections with the same plugin, because it's going to, uh, you know, you're going to want to track your viola part separate from your violin part, from your cello part, from your bass part, so that they all, so you have more control over them, and you can switch out sound libraries or add sounds to them, and many times. I will add real acoustic instruments to the uh, sample library to give it a more realistic sound. Sometimes I'll layer one part on it. Sometimes I'll layer a couple parts on it. Sometimes I won't layer anything on it. Sometimes it just sounds great like it is. Once again, it's really dependent on the sound. But the sound libraries many times will need help and they will need EQ and you don't notice it until you listen to it on small speakers and you'll say, man, I don't hear any clarity in the, mid, in the upper mids. I'm not really hearing that uh, I'm not hearing those lines jump out. So you have to listen to the material that you're uh, recording. Um, and certain libraries sound better than others. And it depends. If it's an orchestral score and it's, you know, you may not need to do anything to it. But um, a lot of times, like I said, I'm going to use a reverb to make things blend uh, together. So with that, I may need to EQ the reverb or I may need to EQ the sound to make it work with the reverb better and with the other instruments. All depends on, uh, on, on what you have going on at the time. In a really dense orchestral mix, you know, there's gonna be a lot, of, there's gonna be writing that you're gonna need to do that, that you would have in a live performance, you're gonna actually, conduct, uh, you know, have the instruments uh, you know, the, the performers are going to control the level of dynamics in their particular part. If they need to bring a particular part out, they're going to play it louder, but you don't quite have that same, um, it's a little bit more difficult to do with virtual instruments. So, like I said, you want to get as many different things on as many different tracks as possible so that you have absolute control over it. The last thing I want to talk about is program EQ. That's your EQ on your entire mix. Things like the Poltec EQP1 was really invented. It's called the program equalizer. It's made EQ the full mix. 
So it does it in really broad, you know, high-end, low-end, uh, and high-end, low-end manner. But that doesn't mean that you can't do um, really kind of detailed cuts or boosts in your mix at the very end. Sometimes I will do that. Sometimes I'll have a mix where I'll be where I'll say, you know, it sounds a little bit muddy, and I and uh, and I might go in. I'll put a mix on the whole EQ. Let's say I'll take take the Cambridge EQ. And I'll go in and I'll take a little bit of 200 hertz out of it or so. And all of a sudden, boom, I've got the clarity. Or maybe I want to add some low sub to it that I feel like, you know, it's not quite there. I want to make the, the, the uh, mix a little bit bigger sounding on the bottom end, a big orchestral piece. So I get, the, get that big, big bottom end. And sometimes I'll be, I'll be boosting in those areas or I'll boost the top, top end. That's usually what happens in mastering is this program EQ where they'll, um, you know, if your things are too dark, they might brighten it up on the top. Mastering isn't quite like it used to be in the old days when you recorded on analog tape and they mastering engineers would get very dark sounding things that they could boost the top end on using analog gear. Nowadays with Pro Tools, Logic, Cubase, it's very different. And if you're using a lot of, uh, you know, sampled sounds, they're already really high fidelity. They've got tons of bottom end, they've got tons of top end, and you don't need to do that much to them. It's only when you have uh, analog instruments, when you have, uh, you know, with a drum sets and, and rock guitars and things like that, that you end up in the mixing stage, you might go in and touch up a few areas of the mix with a, uh, you know, by, by cutting or boosting uh, using a parametric EQ. But a program EQ is just a general, uh, overall, uh, you know, broad stroke EQ that you will use for the entire mix. That's all for now. Please subscribe here to my Everything Music YouTube channel. And if you're interested in the Beato book, write me at rickbeato1 at gmail.com. Thanks for watching. I'm Rick Beato.